and welcome. Welcome to GUI and in web browsers, uh, weekly call for the 2nd of June. Um, yeah, <laughs> so let's jump straight to it. Uh, the first one is a topic about third party pinning integration in desktop and web UI. Uh, yeah, I think most folks on this call have heard this already, but the materials that were sort of sketched out at the pinning summit, um, we've turned those into high fidelity screens. There's two links there. I can share my screen if anybody wants to see them up to all y'all. Yes, please. Okay. At which point everything's going to get all orky on my screen, but let's, let's give this Let's give this a go. All right. Can y'all see that? Yep. Yes. Okay, cool. It's tiny. Let's make it bigger. Um, so these sort of sit in two different, um, they sit in two different flows. One is uh, within the settings screen, the existing settings screen, um, where we've added a box at the top for folks to integrate the pinning services of their choice. The default is just local pinning. If you've got absolutely nothing, oh, someone's bringing me coffee. Hooray. Thank you. <laughs> um, um, so the default, if you don't have anything installed, it's just going to be local pinning. Um, but you add a service and it walks you through this. This um, is sort of an intermediate step while we've still got a small number of providers. We want to showcase them and may have them have big splashy icons um, to encourage more people to do so. If one of these is not the pinning service you want, you can add your own custom one. Um, flow is pretty simple. You give it a nickname in case you have two Infira accounts. You put in your secret key and then um, auto upload. There's a couple of settings for that. I'll go into it. Um, I'll go into that in a sec. You can visit the Pinning Services website. Presumably, um, they will have some nice instructions for you it revolve in, involving getting started um, on web UI or desktop, but that link goes to something external. Um, if it's a custom pinning service, the exact same box, except you don't have a pretty icon and you have to find the API endpoint. There's also a link here that says if you want to make your custom pinning service available to other people, you can do that. That link would go to somewhere on our docs that talks about how to integrate with our pinning API, which does not exist yet. Um, so say you've got a bunch of them because you're a super interesting person. Um, it says the number of files you've got on them, the bandwidth used, which is still a little bit hand wavy. Um, so these are your auto upload settings. Either nothing's going to get auto uploaded or everything you pin to your local node will get automatically uploaded to that third party or all your services will get uploaded. Uh, some more details for how you edit it or remove it. And some little things like say you were auto uploading everything um, or, or you were auto uploading anything and then you say, I wanna upload all my pins. Um, you can say, oh, do you wanna upload it first linking all of the pins that you've currently got. So there's a bunch of, and I, I don't need to go into detail about all of these, but um, there's a bunch of dialogues and such for exceptions. So that's how that lives in the settings screen. I can move on to the file screen if y'all want to see or you have any questions. All right. File screen is very tiny. Oh, this is settings. Sorry. I'm really not a big fan of Figma. Oh, come on. Uh, I can move on and find it. I'm in web, web Figma, and I don't actually know how to use web Figma, uh, which is I a little embarrassing. I link to the chat. Ah, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So this guy's got two flows because we're not completely certain yet whether we want to allow manual pinning of individual files. But say here we are 
sitting in the file screen, it looks fairly familiar, but you've got this somewhat amended pin status column. This is up to a little bit of discussion right now. If it's just locally pinned, you just have a pin. If it's only cloud pinned, cloud pinned. If it's only pinned with a third party service, which is sort of a rare situation, um, that's if you back out of um, one of your automatic preferences and then you unpin something locally, for example. Um, but then you've also got things are pinned to both. Um, if you want to learn more, um, and then there's also, this is probably going to be a little bit tough to do, but in, the idea is floated that you have the standard loading animation while a file is being pinned. Um, that may not happen, but um, that's the affordance if it does. Um, say we have the option for manual pinning. You get this, uh, the three dots menu. You have a set pinning menu option here rather than just pin. Um, that gives you, and if you have more than one file selected, you get set pinning down here, which you currently don't get at all. Um, this will tell you what services you've already got, and you could manually override some of them. So, um, and then also if you need to go to your settings, it'll kick you back to settings if something is strange. Um, if the individual override of the global pinning rules turns out to be too much to deal with, um, then this just go, turns into the pin and unpin menu as we know it. And if you, um, if we've, we've talked about this isn't set in stone, but if you were to just click on this pin status, and this would only be in a world in which you don't have the override enabled because there'd be no other way to find this information. If you clicked on the icon and pin status, it would tell you which services it's pinned with, just with check marks. So you can't do anything. Um, and then there's just a couple of different states in here, some error states. If um, we can't query whether something is successfully pinned, we'll add an overlay icon and a piece of snack bar that says, uh, go check your settings. And that is it so far. Um, I will stop sharing my screen, but there is, and fix the link, there is also an epic um, that we've set up in GitHub. You can click on that to see all the constituent parts. Questions, Rackley. I have a question, if I may. Yeah. Um, what is a local pin signify? Local pin is just that it's pinned at, at your local node. And local node being on a different machine or is that being is that... on the being on the machine that you're using right now so it would be the same the same visual language that you're using in web ui and desktop right now that 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 icon present right now indicates that you're pinned to the box that you're running web ui on at the moment yeah so basically uh, on the top right corner of web ui you got this option to connect to a arbitrary api uh, so the, those local pins are local to the API you connected Web UI to. Because like Web UI lives okay. in IPFS desktop, but some people may just run Web UI on its own, and it will still work. Uh, uh, I, I guess I was assuming that whatever we see in MFS, it's there. It's not going to disappear. It's not going to be GC. But if you do pin it, then it seems like. Oh yeah. So. Uh, Stuff that's in MFS is implicitly pin, uh, and by that I, we mean it won't be garbage collected. So it's like protected from garbage collection, but it's not explicitly pinned. So if you do API call for uh, like pin ls, it won't show up there. Uh, and by w if we add the remote pinning services, and you are able to set up uh, that remote pinning service to automatically uh, pin everything in your MFS. So you got a copy of everything, but maybe you don't want to automatically backup everything and you just want to manually mark things. Here is where we like make those local pins more useful because in MFS, if you pin something, it's effectively does nothing. It just like shows us an explicit pin, but it, it's protected either way. But here this act of pinning and that icon which was kind of useless until now, uh, has a meaning if you set up, it's like a trigger for a triggering remote pin as well. You can set up like 
Pinata to automatically uh, pin stuff you locally pinned and you may that way, it's like a bit clearer visual language of controlling what's pin and what's not without going too deep. And uh, the two flows that Jessica shown on the file screen, the bottom one is like the super simple, the simplest one where you actually are not able to overwrite any uh, pinning strategy apart from tweaking that on the settings. You can either like disable automatically pin uh, local when it's locally pinned or pin everything. Um, so okay. it's just uh, repurposing local pins as a, as a trigger, which kind of like bridges the onboarding, like, like smooths the onboarding for users who are familiar with the idea of pinning, but may not fully understand what's the cloud pin. Okay. I, I just fear it might be a little complicated for people to understand, especially when there are like two different kind of pinning, which one to use when and what they do. Right. And a lot of that I think is going to rely on very good guidance um, around the setup flow for any of those new third party services. We want to make sure that the documentation we provide both ex um, explains a really good, you know, concise definition of pinning on its own, but then also explains really what Lytle just said in terms of why <laughs> maybe introducing the metaphor of using a local pin as a means for doing more useful global or, or other people accessible pins, for example. So yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hinge on really good onboarding documentation. Thanks for explaining. Oh, geez, that other thing is mine, too. Okay. <laughs> um, so we put out that survey, I guess it was about two weeks ago, uh, that said, how do you use IPFS GUI tools? We had 56 responses, which is cool. That's enough to really kind of trust the numbers, but then also still be able to get some usefulness out of the individual verbatim responses. Um, I went over those uh, to start with yesterday and haven't dug too deep, but um, a couple of interesting points is um, kind of everyone uses companion. That's cool. Um, desktop is a little bit more of an all or nothing sort of scenario. People either said they used it often or never, um, which was interesting. Uh, Web UI peaks sort of in the middle of that range and then CLI is fairly universally used. This is something interesting because this aligns with what we have seen, you know, and what we're the, the, the audience assumption we're working on right now is that most respondents are saying there's about 72% say they're using IPFS for learning how to use IPFS and hacking on IPFS. But this gets interesting because um, that motivation is nearly a first place tie with people who are saying I'm using IPFS to publish websites or share things share, or publish articles. Um, the share files was a close third place. So this says something interesting that I'll get to in a second. Um, We'll note that the best loved features are just like real super GUI stuff, visual indicators for network traffic, for bandwidth, the number of nodes connected in your bar, in your browser, uh, right click actions, drag and drop, stuff like that. Um, so this, I think at a very high level is telling us <laughs> we're not gonna be able to align on a, a very well-defined funnel. You know, if you wanna use sort of marketing language around this to get people um, to learn more and engage more with IPFS and that maybe what we need to be thinking about, you know, we've been so focused on the single hacker audience, really. Um, it may be best to start thinking about this as two or three primary journeys or funnels and base that on the core stakeholder types that we had from the ecosystem audit because there isn't really a clear winner here. And I think we're seeing this in some of the collabs discussions as well as we're starting to see um, not super, super, super technical, but moderately technical integration guidance um, or integration inspiration from folks. Um, so, so this is going to get interesting. Um, you know, tentatively, I might think that that splits out along the hackers, the, the very well-informed business users, and then the people who just want to build a website on IPFS, you know, the, the people who are early adopters, but who may not necessarily care passionately about the web, for example, it's like, oh, this is a cool new thing. 
let me play with it. Um, so watch this space. I will share more stuff as I get more stuff. Um, but, but it's interesting just to see that there really was not a clear winner in any of this. Any questions on that? I was surprised that publishing website was higher than sharing files. I know, right? I mean, they're pretty close. They are pretty close, but it's very, it's very definitely publishing websites, sharing files and hacking. And then there's like everything else. Um, and that includes people who responded that they're using IPFS as part of it's, you know, critical to their open source project or it's critical to their, to their business model or something like that, which, um, you know, I expected to see those low, but maybe not that low. So that was interesting. Um, is this, uh, related to trying to figure out what to do with a web UI first or like getting a web UI out of uh, desktop or is it uh, sort of some and some um, so it was a it was a good set of focus questions um, to to get you <laughs> sort of an initial answer to that question um, the answer to that question is fairly murky even just based on the distribution of who uses what um, there's some some nuance in some of the other questions where people are like I, I was I was very surprised to see a lot less confusion around like accidentally trying to open multiple nodes, for example, than we were suspecting. Um, and then the distribution of the where we just flat out asked them if we ripped out desktop, what would that make your life better or worse or not care? Um, that was sort of an interesting one too. So so we may we may actually want to approach this more as just sort of getting an idea of audience segmentation at this point. Um, especially now that we're sort of distracted with the pinning service stuff. <laughs> but, um, but it does give us, it does give us some initial guidance on both of those. And answer your question. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I've been talking for a long time. Can I stop talking now? Okay, cool. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I can pick it up. Uh, I think this one is mine. Um, so uh, subdomains, <laughs> Long time no speak. Um, maybe I'll quickly share my screen. Um, please tell me that you can see something. <laughs> I assume you can see something. So yes, uh, subdomain support for long LCIDs. Uh, there are two fixes. I'm not sure if I mentioned that on this call specifically, I mentioned it on the other calls. So uh, long story short is the longer CIDs do not fit within a 63 character limit of a single label for DNS compliant domain name. Um, it's not a problem right now, but in the future, when we decide to switch to a longer hash by default, or when people start using uh, ED255.19 keys, um, which will probably at some point switch go IPFS as a new default, that will go over when encoded to base32. So the ways to fix it, uh, involve either splitting the label or changing the encoding. Um, and each one has pros and cons. Uh, splitting is easy. Does, you can simply take the CID and add a dot after 63 characters. The problem is that causes problems at uh, subdomain gateways when people want to provide TLS certificate. Uh, there are no multi-level certificates. You can only create a wildcard for a single level. So the problem is if you split, you can only get a cert for a single level. Um, so we looked at uh, ways to fix it. One, we want to provide TLS at the public gateways, at least for the defaults. So the default CAD produced by GoIPFS and the default uh, pure ID, which uh, people will use for publishing IPNS websites at some point in the future. So the fixes are uh, splitting long CIDs uh, at uh, 63 characters. There's an open PR, but I believe we got a consensus that 
it's mostly waiting for uh, being merged and shipped with the next version of the IPFS. And then uh, uh, and the separate fix is using base 36 specifically for those uh, ED255-19 uh, keys. So IPNS websites would fit in a single label and would get a TLS cert. Uh, and I linked a discussion proposed by Peter on if we end up in this situation, we have a uh, base 32 for regular CIDs um, and we get base 36 for those elliptic curve um, keys used for IPNS publishing. So the question was, maybe we should switch everything to base 36 and that's still an open question um, we'll probably have a separate dis uh, design discussion uh, with stakeholders uh, this on, or next week uh, but I just wanted to mention it here if anyone is uh, interested please comment on this issue um, the problems will arise uh, anyway from base 36 we need to add support to that across the ecosystem, it will land in the next version of GoIPFS and JSIPFS, but it will take at least like one or two release cycles until our ecosystem is capable of recognizing this new uh, encoding, which is not that popular. Like Base32 was much more popular and it still was pretty hard to get supported everywhere. And there are still like some libraries like the, the Java HTTP library, which I looked at today, which does not support base 32. So we may need to think about uh, uh, ensuring uh, all encodings used uh, in the wild, at least the defaults and, or like default candidates are supported out of the box. Uh, so that's this problem space and sort of where we are right now, I think uh, the action item here, if anyone is interested, is to comment on the base 36 by default in all contexts. Um, and I just want to highlight that like base 32 are those CIDs that start with Buffy. Like they, they start with B, but the rest is usually the same. And the base 36 gives us CIDs which start with K2, which is also cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's it. Uh, and and it hope, hopefully it was a uh, useful tidbit of information. Any questions? Is, is there any compatibility concern? Like, how, will every single one of our existing clients and libraries and implementations uh, yeah. and yeah, so, existing so the, URLs and addresses all need to be updated. So uh, yeah, it's actually not, it's a, it's a hard question because uh, depends what you mean by compatibility. So uh, this, the CIDs, the content identifiers and the identifiers used in IPFS uh, have text representation and they have like the byte representation of, on the wire. So here we don't talk about changing the byte representation. So all like the networking, lip 2 p stuff, everything uh, on the wire and programmatic interfaces, that will continue to work uh, and will remain backwards compatible. The problem is the text representation because when we create a text representation, we add a base prefix. So when you convert from a text representation to the uh, binary representation, you, we drop, you drop the prefix and the problem disappears. Uh, but the problem here is if someone takes that text and input it in an IP application which talks lip 2 p or talks IPFS, but does not support that specific base encoding, that's the compatibility problem we uh, need to like uh, address before so, so basically well, almost exclusively only user facing places where a CID or address might be used. Yeah, or uh, output in the console, uh, like in Unix, if you like write scripts, programs that operate on text. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I have a question. Uh, as I, or I guess check assumption and the question, uh, I assume that the main reason is to have a uh, origin separation between things. So 
for I'll subdomain say. gateways for the change uh, of the CID used in the subdomain from base 32 to base 36 uh, the the reason is we want to fit in a single label yeah no I, I get it so I guess let me rephrase I think switching from putting CID after the slash and now moving it to the sub origin is mostly to get a separate uh, content separation. Is yeah. that the case? Is there a reason why is this could not be hidden away from the end user scene? Like what I'm imagining gateways could do the internal redirects, but all the printed URLs might still reflect the older way of doing it. So, so this discussion wouldn't be happening. Like I'm concerned that like you might get the same URL, but encoded in different ways and some of them might work and some of them may not work. And that will just create a very confusing situation. Yeah, uh, I totally agree. Uh, what our subdomain gateways do right now, if you use a subdomain gateways uh, such as Dweb link, and you put IPFS path, so Dweb link slash IPFS and CID, and that CID, no matter in which encoding you put it there, our subdomain gateway will automatically normalize that CID to a subdomain safe version and redirect you to a subdomain. And if you use IPFS companion, companion takes advantage of that and uh, redirects you to that uh, router, which automatically converts. Uh, but the problem is user ends up on some subdomain and in that subdomain there's that CID and user may either copy that link and open it in companion or some other tool which understands IPFS but does not understand that CID encoding or they may copy just the CID because they know oh this is the content identifier and I can like simply take it and paste it in IPFS cap uh, capable uh, application and it will just fetch the content. Uh, so that's the the, the gap. Uh, yeah. So this is kind of what I was wondering. Uh, on I did something similar in the experimentation that I've been doing before with Luna, and I think one thing that worked well, and I don't know if it, there are some issues that I'm overlooking, is to have the top level navigation keep the URL. It just for the end user browser, whenever it's top level navigation, you can just navigate to the iframe that internally do the thing, which pretty much takes a whole UI space. And you wind up with a result where it looks like the URL that you typed with slash IPFS slash CID, but internally it will be still origin separated because the thing, everything will actually be loaded under. I, I, I'm, I, I don't want to take out too much time. Maybe this is something worse talking about in the future somewhere else yeah. Uh, I, I yeah I, th like that's one way of addressing it the problem is like uh, it adds a complexity it's no longer just returning yeah. the payload right and and we may revisit it when we have no choice <laughs> for longer CIDs um, but I, I I don't think we will uh, do use like iframe hack for now on subdomains. Um, people just expect actual HTTP payload without any like framing. Um, yeah, but you, you can actually be smart uh, because when you get a request, you can tell whether it's top level okay. load or the uh, thing. So if you curl, for instance, you could actually redirect, but if you loading from the browser, you could. Anyway. Yeah, actually, yeah, actually, we do something similar right now in, on subdomain. So if you ask subdomain for a path using non web browser user agent, which does not follow redirects, you still get the payload response. Uh, but we add like clear cache data uh, uh, to avoid situation when there's like origin leakage. Uh, yeah, definitely. It's, it's yet another option we may consider. All right, uh, maybe lip 2 p upcoming work, guys, maybe. Uh, so yeah, uh, in lip 2 p side of things. Uh, so first, uh, Jacob pushed the button last week and uh, we released the 0 0.28 release candidate. And we hope that we get the final release this week. 
so it is basically we last week we synced uh, about the upcoming work that we expect to have in Lipitp for uh, the upcoming weeks, and I will probably share my screen. Uh, let's see if. Okay. Are you seeing my Chrome? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So first in the 0 0.29 release, we, we are working on uh, shipping three main things, which are the signal, signal sign peer hacker, the rendezvous protocol and the gossip sub v 1.1. Uh, basically the sign peer records, uh, it's uh, needed both for gossip sub and for rendezvous protocol. And uh, specifically to uh, the browser context, uh, it's mostly the rendezvous protocol. And so this release will be focused on both sleep to be hardening and improve the browser experience. Uh, in the rendezvous protocol, I already started implementing it. So I have uh, a PR with uh, an initial workable implementation. There are some things that uh, it doesn't include yet, some like uh, uh, custom parameters that do uh, extra stuff, but in general, we are on a good way to uh, on the rendezvous side of things. And uh, yeah, this is basically the all the milestones that we expect to work on the, during the rendezvous work. And then for the after this, for the 0 0.30, we are uh, planning on working on improving the connection manager, which uh, uh, from until now it's uh, really a basic implementation, and we want to. Uh, as also a, a thing that we need to improve in the browser side, we want to really focus one release on the connection manager. And yeah, that's it. I don't know if anyone has any questions. I got sort of a tangential question. Um, if someone asks me <laughs> uh, today, what's the best we can do uh, for connectivity in a web browser. Uh, what is, it, is it better advice to tell people to stay on that older version of lip 2 p and JSIPFS before the refactor, which still has WebSocket star, or is one of uh, existing uh, intermediate uh, options better? I thought. I think the, the ideal recommendation would be to update to the newest versions and use the WebRTC star, unless uh, WebRTC it's a problem for the project, uh, because basically uh, the amount of versions that people get behind will be uh, each time more difficult and complex to upgrade. And uh, I would say that uh, uh, WebRTC should work for everyone, but I, I've been uh, uh, answering some issues and. Uh, I know that there are people having problems uh, uh, with WebRTC star when using VPNs and other kind of stuff. And uh, so for that specific use cases, maybe it would be better for people to wait, but I would hopefully want people to update sooner rather than later. But yeah, like uh, we are now work started to work on the 0 0.29. So I think we will not take uh, much longer until we have a, a better solution for our users in the browser. Yeah, yeah I think some of the stuff we should do as part of 0.29 when we land rendezvous, because we'll also need to spin up some rendezvous servers for that. Um, Go is also potentially looking at implementing rendezvous um, for different reasons. So we may be able to leverage um, some servers there, but I think we also need to couple, we should couple that with some just generic libptp nodes running as relay servers um, and get those up to really replace um, like WebSocket star, so that we also then have WebRTC star and then rendezvous with Relay, um, which is kind of a more reliable direction that we're looking to go. So I think making sure that we coordinate all of that for 0.29 um, with Infra will be um, important. Uh, yeah, I, I added uh, in the rendezvous uh, a milestone just for uh, the deployment part. So I think I'm tracking that we do that for sure. All right. Um, I we are at the end of our agenda. 
if we have some spare time. So I will quickly go over highlights and in the meantime, you can add any ad hoc uh, topics you want to discuss. Um, if not, we'll uh, free up some time off. Uh, so uh, there have been two releases of Companion. Uh, stable includes changes from the beta. So I'll just quickly mention that uh, IPFS Companion 2.12 uh, landed. Uh, inclu includes previously mentioned a uh, revamp of uh, preferences screen by Jessica. Uh, and it also includes Turkish translation, bunch of fixes and opening ipfs.eth works. <laughs> so I'm not sure, I don't have a note running at the moment, but if you enter ipfs.eth, that will fail because it's not the real TLD. Uh, however, that TLD, uh, however, companion is able to recover from DNS uh, errors now. So uh, if DNS uh, fails, companion checks. If GoIPFS is able to resolve DNS link uh, for ETH, we have a special logic which uh, uses uh, uh, ETH over DNS uh, gateway and DNS link is detected and companion is able to recover and open uh, that website from a local node um, in the same tab. So all that stuff happens behind the scenes. And if you enter ipfs.eth in the address bar, it will just open. Um, so that's an interesting side effect of uh, contribution we received to do the recovery in the same tab. Uh, it also improved uh, UX of uh, ENS websites. Um, and I made a quick uh, release of uh, web UI um, mostly to squeeze it into uh, Go IPFS, but also to not fall behind with all the other projects. Uh, new files, uh, progress feedback for, by Rafael. So when you uh, uh, import files, you, you don't forget what you've imported. Um, uh, some uh, UX improvements for you. Windows users uh, when uh, you need to set up course headers in your local nodes and uh, Catalan uh, language added. Uh, thank you to everyone who contributes translations uh, uh, to uh, IPFS translation project. Um, I know we not always are super fast in shipping those translations, but don't worry, they are not lost. We just uh, we try to bump translations before every release. Sometimes uh, we need to skip one release for technical reasons, but eventually those uh, contributed translations will uh, get to our projects. I'm at the end of my teleprompter. So uh, unless you uh, have any questions to releases or any ad hoc topics, I will make 30 seconds of uncomfortable silence and then I will end the meeting. So think twice. I don't think we need to do it like 30 seconds actually. <laughs> All right. So much Thank thinking. You. Yeah. All I right. saw it at least three times. <laughs> All right. Uh, so see you in two weeks. Thanks so much for joining. Bye. Bye. Bye.